the gospel, as well as the lesson from Isaiah, as well as the psalm, lay out a, a kind of timeline. On the one hand, in both the Isaiah lesson and the Old Testament lesson, two things are affirmed. One is the goodness of God that spans all of time, past, present, and future. The second thing is it affirms the goodness of what things will be in the end, when the dead shall rise, when all of the kingdoms are brought together to serve the Lord. And yet, Israel is right here, in the middle. On the one hand, God is good. The end is going to be good. Right now, it's not so good. And they're crying out to God, longing for this completion that they have yet to see. Unjust circumstances, longing and praying for a just God to be good to act, meaning to act, and to act on their behalf in the carrying out of his purposes. In many ways, Jesus says the very same thing within the context of the gospel. He uses an analogy. The analogy is a yoke. And of course, you know what a yoke is. Mm -hmm. It's a bar. It has two pieces on it just like that. And through the head of those yokes, are two horses or two oxen to drive the plow, and therefore they're under the command of a master who can pull it this way or pull it that way, and if they don't follow, <laughs> they can feel it right there in the neck. The yoke, until actually these words from Jesus were heard in the nation of Israel as a symbol of oppression. All through the Old Testament, when the word yoke is used, it's almost always the yoke of oppression. And so who's the driver? The driver is Assyria. The, the, the driver is Babylon. In other words, it's not a good driver. These drivers are pulling them because they are in slavery, doing what they don't want to do, crying out to God. Jesus takes that same analogy, the yoke, which his hearers would automatically assume, oh, he's going to talk against Rome now and the oppression that we feel living under the Roman oppressors. And he does something very, very surprising. He says, take my yoke, your yoke, and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly and hard, and you will find rest for your souls. A yoke is how we find rest for our souls. But Jesus' yoke, I'm convinced, is very, very different from the yoke of the Assyrian, the yoke of the Roman, the yoke of the oppressor. Because it is both an outward yoke, but it's also an inward yoke as well. In other words, when I see the yoke of oppression, I can see the ring around the horse's neck being pulled this way and being pulled that way. We do have in Jesus that which works in us to guide us this way and that. So there is a rod, but it's a good rod. It's not an oppressive God because rod because we are trusting God to guide us in the way that we should go, even when we don't want to go there, to take us in his hand and take us through places that even might be difficult and painful at times, but they are there and we are going through them in a sense of divine appointment. So that even in the midst of hardship, because we bear the yoke, we know that we are there by divine appointment, and therefore we can trust that God will give us what we need to be able to live in the midst of even the worst of difficulty. In other words, the yoke of God is permanent in that sense. It's not just to deal with our honoriness, it's to carry out God's good purpose. But here's where I think this yoke is different. I think the yoke actually goes across, in essence, our shoulders, if you want to keep the visible analogy. But instead of circling our neck, it comes up underneath us. Because the seat of the yoke of God is both in terms of dealing with external circumstances, but also with the matter of the heart. Because the promise of the new birth, the presence of Christ, is, again, to quote the Old Testament, I will put a new heart I will remove the heart of stone 
and I will give you a heart of flesh so that they shall know the Lord. Meaning this is a yoke that doesn't just guide, it actually also, because it's underneath us, upholds. For the Lord will uphold the righteous. He will defend them with his favor as with a shield. And that is the difference between the yoke of oppression and the yoke of Jesus. Because the presence of the yoke of Jesus is actually the changed heart. That he is working in us something more than we could ever amass, ask or imagine. So that the rest that we know is in fact, even in the midst of tumultuous circumstances, a rest of the heart. A heart that says, in the midst of difficulties that I do not understand, I know that I am not abandoned by God. I know that his presence and his power, the very same spirit which raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in me. And that is what upholds. Which is why even in the midst of difficult circumstances, Jesus can promise rest. Which is exactly, you see, what his hearers knew. His hearers were living, living under a terrible time of both political as well as religious oppression. And yet, in the midst of those difficulties, outrageous, painful difficulties, Jesus promises rest. So when I think of the yoke now, I don't think I'm trading one oppressor for the other, for another. Instead, what I'm doing, and this is where the trust comes in, you have revealed these things not to the wise, meaning the independent, I know where I'm going and what I'm doing, but to babes, those who have to trust in someone because they cannot take care of themselves. That to come into that yoke is in fact a place of great breadth, great protection, great trust, deep, companionship. All that I need in the midst of even the worst of circumstances to be able to serve and to live with a level of poise and bravery, courage even. The difficult circumstances demand but it's not panicky. It's not flighty. It's not impulsive. Instead, there's the capacity this rest gives us to be able to think and operate in a way that expresses the very grace and guidance of God. That is his yoke. It not only guides us in the midst of our rebellion, but also poises and protects and leads our hearts. That in the midst of even the most difficult of circumstances, we can lead and serve in a way that really does look like the grace of Christ. Amen. Amen.